Let's talk about how I made a massive multiplayer game with Unity called Maze. The twist of this game is that you actually need to cheat to solve the challenges. The goal is to teach people about game hacking and if you are a game developer, hopefully this also gives you a better idea how this looks like. By the way, this is part three in my devlog series. In the first video, I explained how I learned game development with Unity. In the second video, I talked about game design and building my first hackable game. But that was also an offline game and in offline games it's always be easy to cheat and uncover secrets and especially with Unity it's pretty easy. So I decided to make an online game. An online game has the advantage that we can have an authoritative server that renders cheating on the client useless. If you intend to play the game yourself and try the hacks without spoilers then don't watch this video it will reveal quite a lot. Chapter 1 Using Networking Provider Let's start with the elephant in the room, the networking part. So implementing networking for a game is a whole profession for itself and every game has unique requirements too. Specifically for Unity there is the deprecated UNet and through research I also found alternative providers of networking solutions for games. But the problem for me is not only does that cost money, these libraries are also a lot of magic. They abstract away a lot of functionality and generally you need to run that on their servers and services. But if I make a game that is hackable, I need to 100% understand the protocol and the server setup. I don't want that people attack a third party service or find bugs in the protocol itself. At least when I don't know if it's possible. I'm also guessing that a lot of these protocols work by serializing objects and deserializing them on the server, which introduces a huge attack vector and could even lead to remote code execution on the server. This obviously depends on how the objects are serialized and deserialized, but my issue is that it's unknown to me and I would have to do a lot of research to reverse engineer what these libraries are doing to see if it can be used for my purpose. So it was very clear to me right from the start that I need to implement the server myself. Chapter 2. Language to implement server. Let's ignore for a moment the general architecture of a game server and speak just about practicability for me to write one. I've heard a lot that Golang is super cool for networking, but I can't really write Go, never really used it. So I was contemplating if this project could be the perfect opportunity to learn Go. This is what I like to do when learning a new programming language. I'm not just sitting there and say, I'm learning Go now. I always need a project, a purpose, a goal for what I want to use the language for. So this would be perfect. But I also was a bit in a hurry because our hacking competition for which I wanted to create this game started on the 1st of March running for 3 months and I only started to learn Unity at the beginning of January and when I started this online game it was already late February. I didn't have to be ready on the 1st of May but this meant I have at maximum around 2 months time for it. But not full time I still have regular work and YouTube and stuff to take care of. So I decided to stick with the language I have the most experience with and that's Python or to be more precise Python 2. Just kidding I did switch to Python 3 now RIP. Chapter 3 The Server Architecture there's a lot of talk regarding UDP versus TCP packets for games and we'll talk about that but that's just the transport layer. I think it's a bit more important to talk about how you structure the server in the first place and just assume you have clients that spam the server multiple times per second with some kind of position update packet. So how do you share these position updates between all the clients with minimal overhead, good performance and low latency? I have never done something like this and so I wanted to share what went through my head and I'm fully aware that my solution is not the best and I'm sure there are much better ways to implement it than what I came up with. But it's really hard to decide because you lack a lot of important data. For example, how many players at the same time should be able to see each other on the server? What is reasonable memory and CPU usage per client on the server? Do you have a single beefy machine with hundreds gigabytes of RAM or do you need to split it up on multiple small machines? So the first question I had was, how do I share the position information between all the connected clients? I have to make this clear again. I have no experience building such an application where the bottlenecks really are and I'm just drawing from my limited knowledge and hoping that my educated guesses are not super wrong. So keep that in mind before you flame me for something I do but I'm very interested in uh, proper feedback. Anyway, if the server is a single process and maybe each client has a thread I could use some shared memory with some kind of array to store all the client's positions. 
I could even have some easy functionality to relay or forward the position update from one client to all the other clients within that process. Obvious first problem, it wouldn't easily be scalable to multiple machines or even multiple processes. Using Python as a server has the issue that I'm bound to the GIL, the global interpreter log. So I was also concerned that a single process would not be able to switch between threads or whatever fast enough doing the networking for each client so that a single client could microfeeze or even block the whole server. You can see using a single process, I would get no benefit from a multi-core system. The solution to that issue is obviously using multiple Python processes, but that would mean I don't have shared memory to share the position data of the connected players. But I had an idea for that. The other issue is in general, the single core performance per process but I was thinking to solve that with async coding. I've also not really much experience with async in Python, how efficient that is, but in my mind, I imagine that being able to defer functions when they are needed and have the event loop take care of maximum utilization, that would make at least a single process efficient enough. But what about sharing of player positions now? I could use any kind of database like MySQL and each client just writes its position to one row in a table but I imagined that to be rather slow. And I was more thinking towards some database that is intended for super fast access, read and write. What kind of database would that be? Well, I thought any data storage used for caching on web servers should probably be great for my purpose. And so I was going for Redis. Redis is an open source in-memory data structure store and used as a database cache and message broker. So not only could Redis simply hold any kinds of information, I could use it as a message broker to share important messages to the other clients, like another client updated its position. At least that's what I thought. I don't know if Redis is the fastest, I don't know if it's the best scalable, I don't know if I, if I used it right, but I know that Redis is used in massive production deployments and certainly could be scaled crazily. And so for my small usage of maybe a couple of dozens or hundreds of players, it should be good enough. And now that I use Redis, I can easily spawn multiple Python processes as game servers and all of them access the same Redis instance to exchange player positions. So to summarize, the idea was to spawn multiple Python processes to handle multiple clients and Redis is used as a backbone to distribute the game's position data or, or general game data across all players. But position data is only one of the important information. Authentication information, profiles, and items stored, they are accessed rarely and it might make sense to have that stored in a slow but atomic safe database. But for me, I didn't really care about that because it was just for a hacking competition and if players lose their account or whatever, it doesn't matter. So I just used Redis. Chapter four, UDP versus TCP. The question that everybody wants to know, UDP or TCP? The big difference that probably everybody knows is that UDP is connectionless protocol, which means a client simply fires UDP packets to a server. And if some of them do not arrive or a different order, that doesn't matter. TCP on the other hand ensures that every packet arrives and is in the correct order. Now, when we think about position updates from a player, which might happen multiple times a second, yeah, we don't care if all of them arrive, but we probably still care about the correct order. Imagine you walk forward and then suddenly an old packet that tells the player is 10 meters back arrives and resets the player there. So we already have to implement some kind of sequence identifier so we can know if we received an old packet or not. And then there are actions a player does where we need to be sure that it was received. Imagine a player unlocks something, sells an item, gets a drop, whatever. It's like a one-time thing and we want to be 100% sure that it arrived. And in that case, we would essentially re-implement TCP's ACK packets to acknowledge we received something and also implement that the client remembers the packets it sent and for which it never received an acknowledgement for, then do a retransmission of the missed packets after a sensible timeout. Also, when the client or server closes, exits, crashes, the other side doesn't realize that the client would just happily keep sending UDP position update packets. All things that you need to consider and handle. So I don't think TCP is a super bad choice because it means you don't have to care about a lot of things. It makes it a lot easier. So for a small game, it's a very good choice. But because Pwn Adventure was already TCP based and I have actually never implemented anything with UDP, I thought it would be fun to use UDP instead. Chapter seven, the network protocol. 
Now that I know I'm gonna have bunnies running around and I'm using UDP, it was time to think about the protocol. Basically, what kind of packets do exist that the server and the client exchange? And this was also an iterative process. I started out with some basic stuff that I needed, but this was growing and changing over time. I didn't really plan this much, to be honest. Basically, it went like this. The protocol itself is gonna be binary data, simply using Python struct to pack and unpack binary values, easy peasy, don't need anything fancy, and I also checked that I can pack and unpack binary data in C Sharp. Chapter eight, position packet. So the first packet I thought about was obviously the position packet. And here you have three options. You could simply send absolute position data, X, Y, Z, and rotation of the character. You could also send a delta saying, I move two meters forward. But that requires that the packet must be acknowledged. If one delta packet is lost, the client and server get out of sync. Or you could even simply transmit the action and the server tells what happens. So for example, the client says, the forward button is pressed and then the server checks for how long and performs that movement. Delta packets or even actions are more effort to implement. They also have some advantage, namely with regards to cheating, because the server is more authoritative and can really decide on each action if it's valid. While when it's a simple position information, the server loses a lot of context what actually happened to reach this position. So can't be super accurate verifying it, at least in 3D games where it maybe leaves room for some hacks. Because I need something simple and I want to leave room for hacks, for me it was clear to simply transmit the current position. And now we come to the iterative process designing this. Let's say the server receives such a position packet. How does the server know which client sent it? There is no open socket connection. Anybody could spoof any UDP packet. So we need some kind of identifier, which should be unique and not guessable. Chapter eight, login packet. Knowing that I need some kind of identifier, I created a login packet, which takes some kind of authentication information from the player and then generates a secret session ID, like a session cookie on a website. The client then must include the secret session ID in every packet to identify itself. If you want to do this properly, you would now create some kind of registration website where players can register an account and with those credentials, they can then send the login packet to get the session ID. But I was too lazy for that and I simply used a single secret without prior registration. If a player logins with a new secret that hasn't been used before, the server creates a new character. If it's a known secret, it simply uses the character already stored in Redis. Basically, it's implicit registration with only a password. No checks for collisions. It's shitty, but good enough. Remember, I optimize here for laziness, not uh, prettiness. This also bit my ass during live streaming the game on Twitch. Two times I accidentally showed the login window where it shows you your secret. No, I'm an idiot. Luckily, the accounts were only test accounts and didn't actually have anything unlocked. And it also wouldn't really be an advantage. It's not like you could get access to flags through that. Chapter nine, heartbeat packet. Now that I started implementing those first packets, I also realized that I need to be able to identify if clients exit the game or if the server crashes. Now, the server constantly gets position updates from a player, which should be enough to implement a timeout if there was none for a period of time. But the server might not always have packets for the client, especially if they are alone on the server, like I always was during testing. So I implemented a heartbeat packet. Now, which direction do you do the heartbeat? Does the server send heartbeats to the client and the client answers? Or does the client send it to the server and the server answers? I decided to initiate it from the client, mainly because during implementation, I noticed that it's not easy to initiate packets from the server. I would need some kind of loop or thread that orchestrates when to send a heartbeat. That would be an overhead and complexity. On the client, on the other hand, there's already code that updates players' positions every time. Games generally work with a game loop in Unity, namely this update function, which is called each frame. So it's much easier to periodically send a heartbeat from the client to the server, and then the server responds, yep, I got it. Chapter 10. UDP reflection attack. So while I was implementing the server in Python and doing the client component in Unity, I thought more about the issue of UDP reflection or UDP amplification attacks. UDP is connectionless, which means anybody can spoof IPs in UDP packets. And so the server might send a response back to the spoofed address. This doesn't really happen for TCP because there is this handshake back and forth and you need to be able to receive the response in order to get the exchange of 
the actual data. But a small reflection still can be abused with TCP because obviously you can spoof the IP of the first SYN packet and then the server responds with the SYN ACK to that IP. But it's a very small packet. And if I want to attack a victim server with a bandwidth of one gigabytes per second, I need to send one gigabytes per second to a server which then reflects, basically reflecting one-to-one -one the SYN acts to the victim. But the real threat comes with UDP being able to amplify the traffic. If a small UDP packet causes a large response, it can have a one to 10, one to 100, or even larger amplification. So by sending one gigabyte per second to a vulnerable UDP server, I could create traffic of 10 gigabytes per second directed at a victim. So I need to make sure I don't have small packets sent from the client to the server that cause the server to respond with a large amount of data to a spoofed IP. When I thought about how to resolve this, I realized I can use the client secret that I mentioned previously. On any important packet, the client has to include a secret. This secret is then used to fetch the information for the player from Redis. So I decided to remember the source IP when the player logged in and checks it every time when a new packet arrives. If the packet suddenly changed because somebody spoofed it, I outright ignore the packet. I don't even respond. I just don't do anything. This means the login packet can still be used for reflection, but you can't prevent that. It's like the TCP SYN packet. It's very small, so it doesn't offer any amplification, and that's just how it is. Chapter 11, UDP client in C-sharp. Maybe it would be good to share a few words on implementing the UDP client in C-sharp for Unity. I have to warn you though, my code is incredibly ugly and bad. Please don't use this as some kind of template, okay? I didn't have much time and I was just rushing. If I would take this more seriously, I would have to refactor the code. Anyway, I have a server manager script, which is the core for the networking. Here you can see, for example, that I referenced the player character as well as the prefab, which will be used to spawn the other players on the map. In the start function, I trigger a coroutine, which makes a delay login, and I don't remember why I would do this. This then calls login, which gets the game server and possibly ports, and then creates a new UDP client and connects to it. After that, we start a receive thread that will wait for UDP packets sent from the server to the game. Then there are three more coroutines. One is to actually perform the login with the login packet, and the other two are basically queue workers. I show later what I use them for. In the login loop, we get the player's secret and hash it. The reason is basically we only need a very strong eight byte random secret for the login and the chosen player password could be longer. So we hash and reduce it to eight bytes. That is fairly random and unique. Then we prepare the raw byte packet sent to the server, one byte for the ASCII character value L, for login, then comes the eight byte user secret, followed by one byte encoding the length of the username and then copying the username. Now, if you are into security, I know, I know this looks like a buffer overflow, but the username is restricted to 32 bytes on the login screen and it has no security relevance here. Just terrible code. Anyway, after that, we send the packet to the server and wait for two seconds. You can see that this happens in a while loop and this logged in flag is set by the receive thread in case we receive the answer to this login. If we don't receive it, we try to log in again. So let's look into the receive thread. This is basically just a big loop that tries to receive bytes from the server. I also added a very simple encryption layer to the protocol, which you can see here. The first byte is the key, and then we simply XOR each byte with that key, and then also modify after each byte the key a bit. Very simple and with the Unity game reverse engineering tools easy to get. After that, we just have a big if else case that checks what type of packet it is and then unpacks the binary data and handles it. For example, if we receive a packet with a capital L, it will be the login response and we are logged in. Here you can also see it returns unlocks encoded in two bytes, which will tell the game if you have certain things unlocked. Here's for example, the code that handles position data from other players. This might include many players, so there's a loop, and it simply gets the player ID, the player coordinate and rotation angles, as well as some info if the player is grounded or has other triggers. Those are used to determine if there should be a certain animation played. This information is packed into an NPC event object and placed into a queue. Oh, <laughs> this is actually a bug. I changed this to a map, as you can see here below. The reason for that was that initially it was a queue, but what if the queue is consumed too slow and new information arrives, then the older player position should be ignored. Also, I had a bug where the queue was only consumed once a frame. And when there were multiple players, it would start fill up the queue more and more and more. 
and very slowly only consume it, thus you would later see actions by players that happened long in the past. I didn't notice this bug when I was uh, testing alone, but only when we did a first stream about this game, we did realize this behavior. Anyway, right now I still place it in the queue and never consume it, thus probably create a very hefty memory leak. Oops, let's comment that out. Anyway, the reason why I don't update the player's objects positions right here in the thread is that you cannot do that. This thread is not allowed to access objects from Unity thread. So that's why I use an event object and in the consume player queue coroutine, we loop over all the available keys in this player dictionary and for example, set the new position for that particular player. And we also trigger here the animations. Fun fact. The attack animation, for example, cannot be triggered in game. You have to hack the game and send the packet yourself in order to trigger this animation. But this is one of those Easter eggs players could find to show off to other players. Lastly, I want to mention that in the NPC controller script, the script handling each other player, the incoming position update is not directly applied, but kept in a variable and then slowly, relatively, within a couple of frames animated. So it gives a sense of fluid movement not strict teleporting new positions. Chapter 12, UDP server in Python. Now let's look at the server code a bit. As I mentioned, I implemented it in Python and there are multiple instances of this code running, but I try to make each server as efficient as possible to handle multiple clients. But like with anything I code, I'm not sure if this is the best design. It makes sense in my head, but I have not profiled this. I have no data. But as I said, I used asyncio to process packets as efficiently as possible. Here you can see that the main server class is derived from asyncio datagram protocol, so a UDP server. And here's the datagram receive function, which is called when a UDP packet arrives, and it immediately passes the data as a task to the asyncio event loop. Then eventually this is processed here. This function starts by trying to decrypt the received packet with the basic XOR shown in the C sharp client. And after that, there are basic if cases checking the type of the packet. For example, here it sees a login packet, which then gets handed over to the packet handler login function. There it takes the user secret and uses it to get an associated internal ID. It also checks if the user is already logged in, and in that case rejects the login attempt. Eventually it gets the unlocks of the user and creates the login response packet. But it also performs a teleport, which basically sends back the spawn position for the player. The packet handler for receiving position data is actually the longest because this is also where cheating could happen. Think about speed hacks and teleports. Here you can see how the binary data from the packet is unpacked to get the position and rotation angles. And it also checks if the received packet is newer than the past packet. And then a distance is calculated based on the old and new position, as well as the speed based on the old time and the new time. If a certain speed or distance is exceeded, a hacker is detected and the player is teleported back to the original position. Besides that, I also implemented wall collision detection here on the server. I've created a picture that color encodes where players can walk and are not allowed to walk, so the walls. And the player position is translated to a pixel on this image and then the color is checked. If the player is on a white pixel, so on a wall, the player is teleported back to the original position. I also use these color encodings to implement other stuff related to challenges and locations. For example, when you discover a certain area, it will set the correct unlock and it will give you access to the teleporter. This is also used to check if you enter the teleporter and if you have the correct unlock and in that case, teleport you to that location. You might also see here the code that says send flag. Those are the secret flags that players can get when they solve the hacking challenges. Chapter 14, distribute player position. When a player sends their current position to the server, the other players somehow have to be informed about that. And this caused a bit of a headache. My first attempt was to implement this directly in the position packet receive handler, basically adding a loop that goes over all logged in players, gets their connections, IPs and ports and send them a UDP packet with the player's position. And this worked fine until I used a second process. As soon as I had multiple processes, I noticed that if a client is connected to one port, so one of the processes, but receives the packet from a different process, it didn't arrive. And I actually don't know what exactly the issue was. I'm not super experienced with networking. My guess was that it had to do with the NAT 
from the client's router and it didn't recognize where the packet should go. I tried to solve this by also setting the source port of the UDP packet, but it just didn't work. I also didn't investigate this further. There was another idea I had, which was we could spawn an additional thread per client that observes a message queue. For example, we could use Reddit as a message broker for that. And when a new possession update comes in, it gets sent to the client. But the server is kind of stateless so far and doesn't really allocate or hold anything of a client. Redis holds the state. So I didn't really like that. So instead of this push design, I actually implemented a pull design. I was thinking the player is sending its own position packet to the server all the time anyway. So we can just answer to the packet with the position information from the other players. Not the coolest solution, but it works. In the end, I actually moved this into the heartbeat handling instead because the player sends the position multiple times a second, which is necessary to have these cheat checks on the server but other players don't matter too much. So let's use the heartbeat, which is sent less often, but this way we don't spam the server and climb too much. I thought this way we could handle a few more players, even though it's not the best in terms of seeing other players' movements. Chapter 15, HTTP server component. Besides the Python UDP server and the C-sharp UDP client, I also created a minimal Flask web service to be used as a backend. And there you can get a list of players see if they are online and what they have unlocked and also configure some stuff about the game. For example, the ports uh, for the UDP servers and where the UDP game servers are hosted. So this web API is accessed to get some information by the game before the look in UDP stuff happens. Here I also draw a heat map of where players walked as well as show players that are currently online. I've also created a heat map animation from the first few days of this game's release. It's super long, but kind of cool to see. For example, here, somebody already figured out how to teleport around and use it to scan the whole maze to create a map. Pretty cool. In this video, we covered a lot of technical aspects. So in the next video, let's talk about the level design and the challenge design. Full of spoilers, but just wanted to share what I was coming up with.